welcome coming into our 80s den. Thanks for continuing on this journey with us. Who would have thought we'd get to episode five and yet here we are. I've been pretty confident that we're gonna go all the way. <laughs> all the way to episode six. All the way to episode 100 plus. Yay. Um, hope you're all having a good week. Hope you have jam packed your lockdown week with plenty of- Sunbathing. Films. And sunbathing. <laughs> and sunbathing. Britain certainly is. Um, Want to give a shout out, SFX magazine. Whoop, whoop. Little Flash Gordon spread. Little mention of life after Flash. Thank Not so you. little, to be honest. It's pretty impressive. They spoke to Sam, Melody, Richard O'Brien, Mike Hodges, Brian Blessed, Howard Blake. Pick up a copy. Um, if you are not in the UK and can't get to a supermarket, I'll put a link below of where you can buy it. Check it out. What do we have on the show today? It's an exciting one today. If you are into Marvel, comic book, drawing, superheroes, all that amazing imagination, we have an interview with the incredible Alex Ross. We met Alex during Life After Flash filming and he was a fabulous person, so so excited that we have him on the show today. Stay tuned to the end of the show as well because we also have Bob's Bee Cave with another great prop and the winner of last week's competition. So do not be skipping forward, stay with us. The competition will be announced later, but before, let's get stuck into an interview with Alex Ross. Life After Flash, I was lucky enough to interview the fabulous uh, and intimidatingly talented Alex Ross uh, for the documentary. And Alex has so kindly joined me today for the web show. Alex, how are you? I'm doing very well, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, so you have done some incredible work. I mean, ridiculously incredible work. What are some of your early art inspirations that you had? Uh, all the things I was seeing in comic books or on television. So I was looking at Spider-Man on TV when I was a kid, and that led to all the other superheroes I would get to see, you know, uh, Superman, Batman, all the superhero groups you can remember, and, uh, and then of course, eventually Flash Gordon. Now we've mentioned it, Flash Gordon was obviously a huge inspiration, and I could have talked to you for hours on the subject. How did the inspiration and what you took from Flash how was your, your future art inspired by that? Well, in a really weird way, because I saw Sam as kind of like my ultimate male model kind of face type. He had those arched eyebrows and, you know, dramatic, strong features, very strong draw, jawline. And um, I incorporated him into my art as kind of my male avatar. So the characters I was making up personally that were superheroes of all different types, he was the lead character. So, and I made the character uh, brunette as I was back then. Um, so it was um, really more like what Sam naturally looked like without the dyed hair in Flash Gordon. But he made such an impression on me with that one movie that he stuck in my head throughout the rest of my teen years. It was informing the way I was drawing faces around the age of 11, because that's 1981 for the year. Uh, the film was still in theaters after it came out in Christmas of 1980. And I was drawing everything to look a little bit Sam influenced at that stage of my life. And that would grow and change over time where I would start to slowly break off of that, but I was still, thinking of him specifically, I wasn't going towards photographs to look at him at that time. I was mostly just going by memory. So it would take another 10 years for me to get in the habit of looking at photo reference as the basis for how I would illustrate things in a more realistic fashion. But in all that time before, when I'm just drawing out of my imagination, he was there in my mind. And um, as far as a lot of the professional work I've done, I didn't use his face indiscriminately on a lot of other characters. So I made a point of thinking of his face for a couple specific people. Uh, they're really odd references. The character in the Kingdom Come series is a kind of vaguely hard to understand what, who he is character, a man who has dark hair, is wearing a business suit. And if you interpret his Arabic name, he's supposed to be the legacy of uh, the classic comics character, Ra's al Ghul, but his name actually means son of the bat. So it's a, a thing, if anybody gets it interpreted, then they understand, oh, that's Batman's grown son in the story. 
And then it doesn't get very explained. It's just, it's just thrown in there. But I was basing the likeness more upon Sam. And when I was doing uh, my first work with Marvel's at Marvel Comics, I didn't get a chance to do this, but I did sketches before based on Sam's likeness as if he might have been the handsome guy that the villain Dr. Doom was before he had his accident to become covered in a big metal mask. Were there any other films that you grew up with um, as a kid that inspired you as much as Flash Gordon? A lot of things would make an impact in my art in one way or another, stealing things like I stole a a uh, soldier costume design from Escape from New York and turned it into a whole character that I built up a lot of stuff around when I was a teenager. Um, you know, of the films of that time, they still have an effect on me. Like I'll still bring things from the film Tron into design work because it's always interesting to imagine costume elements that are luminous. And that film introduced that concept and that's one of those 80s films that still has a strong impact both upon the way I felt at the time I saw it and what I think about today. I'm, I'm going to collect any toys they make of that film because it still has that sweet spot for me. Did you see the most recent Tron? It has a lot of strengths and then it has actually some of the same exact uh, failure points, which is that at a certain midpoint of the movie, energy sort of just comes to a dead stop <laughs> in the storyline. But I, I love the film. I just, it, it, plus also they tried that graphic thing with uh, Jeff Bridges' younger face that didn't quite pan out. And uh, I wish they had the deep fake technology back then. I saw a video that you had spoken about Justice League um, being superheroes you specifically connected with as well. Why is that? I mean, the most obvious thing is that it was the most in your face. If you're growing up in the 70s and 80s, you would have only had one superhero group on television, and that was the Super Friends. And of course, that's the Justice League of America in their most kind of limited form. But when, as a kid like I was, when you'd been watching it for season after season, and then they finally did a season where they brought in more of the characters than just the lineup that had, you know, four or five heroes. You suddenly had 10 and it had these oddball characters I knew from the comics that are now being seen by a greater number of people like Hawkman, Green Lantern, Flash. That was super exciting. And, and that bored into my brain more than say the availability of concepts like the Avengers or the X-Men who just, seemed like they were so far away from ever getting that embrace of popular culture because they didn't have the marketing. Um, it's not their fault. They had great comics, but they just weren't being seen by the general public in the same way that DC had gotten that huge step forward. I would love to talk to you about your creative process. Um, so you get um, commissioned hired, you get a project to work on, asked to work on a project. What happens then? How, what is the characterization process? Do you come up with the creative look for it? Is there input from other people? How do you work? The way I approached uh, comics from my youth of looking at the people I admired, a lot of the things that were created were projects they themselves had crafted or created. So I wanted to be that kind of uh, craftsman who was pitching things, who was telling them what story I wanted to create instead of being told what they would manufacture internally. So a lot of the things I'm most known for are projects that I pitched. They just happen to utilize the most well-known properties that we all know. So when I did Marvels or Kingdom Come, those were things that you know, we're utilizing those characters I didn't create, but the storylines, the presentation was something I had to talk the companies into. And that would carry me through the first several years of projects I've worked on. And it's only been in the last 20 years, I've got a 30 year career in comics now. I, I've only had the last 20 where I've played around with things that maybe I was talked into myself. And just to see how well that would be, uh, nothing I've done in the last 20 years competes with stuff I did in my 20s, weirdly. And that's just the nature of how life goes, is that, you know, you could be a, I'm officially a has-been at 50. Everything I've done for the last 25 years has not competed with stuff I did when I was 25 years old. 
Is that because you felt like you were a bit more adventurous creatively, maybe in your early years? There's such a thing as having something to prove. You know, I was young and trying to do something that would be breaking some kind of ground, if not for me, then even for the art form. It was unique to have painted comics 25, 30 years ago. It's really not unique now. So when I was bringing my form of illustration into more of the mainstream of comics, it wasn't that it hadn't been published. There had there been lots of painted comics. There just hadn't been as much of an embrace of painted realism with the traditional mainstream superhero content. And also somebody that was really into it. Somebody that wasn't just hired to do a job, but was doing something they were passionate for. And I certainly had a lot of passion for that. I still do, thankfully. How has the advent of digital technology changed how you work, if it has at all? It means that I have to know some of the terms so I can have some of the conversations about saving files and DPI. And I have absolutely no understanding and retention of how this stuff really gets done. So I've never learned how to use a computer. I don't write emails. I don't type. I do all that through dictation. (laughs) And all the work that gets done with my paintings is scanned by people I work with so that I send the work to them and um, they scan and, and then color correct. And all the things that I, on average, the modern artist works with all those tools, knows how to tweak things in Photoshop. And I just never bothered to do that because I wanted to keep my hands immersed in the tactile reality of paint on paper as much as I can. doesn't mean that fixes don't happen digitally. They do. They just don't become something I lean on. Whereas contemporary artists are very adept at all these modern tools, which I completely respect. I just figure I wanted to make it to my grave without having learned anything new. It was one thing I really was envious when we met you, when we found out how little technology you have in your life because I feel like everyone is so bogged down with technology that it kind of takes away from like you say the magic of you know even someone who writes a letter as opposed to an email and and you with painting and with your pen do you feel that are there many artists that still have that kind of use the term old school way of uh, the approach to art or do you find that majority people have gone towards the kind of digital artist approach? I certainly would be the majority, sure, but there's plenty of people who do like to work with natural materials and then I believe from the friends I've talked to work in digital illustration, they still like to get their hands into drawing on paper occasionally and shift back and forth. So I, I see it as something that it's flexible for everybody working in Uh, their art. It's just that professionally, a lot of people working on stuff like video games, I know many people doing that, uh, it's just not going to apply to their world as easily as it might in mine. And they have to make corrections in their work. That's one of the big differences from doing the stuff I do in comics where I have, I'm kind of a known quantity and I'm working with people that give me a certain amount of latitude. I don't get a ton of fixes on my work. Whereas if you're working on a video game that has a huge budget and loads of different people collaborating, you have to expect revisions and those revisions are most easily done through layers on computer. And you don't stop and start a physical painting with that great of ease. What, well, that might be the answer to my next question, but what are your biggest challenges that you face with how you approach your art? I, in a way, I've removed a whole lot of them, so it can come down to just simple satisfaction of whether or not I like what I've turned out and that everything still is an experiment. Nothing's 100% going to work out the way I intend. I can plan something out with a very tight sketch, and then once I'm putting paint on paper, um, even if I did, which I rarely do, a color sketch beforehand to test out the color scheme I have in mind, um, it's all the way that the paint might soak in and then I'm, I could be fighting the painting. There's all different kinds of things where I can put in many hours of time and feel dissatisfied. And, um, but I, I've learned to move on very quickly so it doesn't stay with me and, and kind of uh, bring me down in a way where I don't feel like doing the next thing. I, I always like to attack my problems by trying to go and take on the next challenge. Out of everything that you have done in your incredible career um, thus far, what are you most proud of? 
Boy, um, I'm, I mean, in the broad sense, it's the fact that I did create original works that I was a co-creator of. And of those, a lot of things I love, like, you know, I'm most known for Marvels and Kingdom Come. Uh, the one that's gotten overlooked in my body of work is the one I did right after Kingdom Come called Uncle Sam, which was kind of a reflection upon American history and politics. And uh, I did a lot of work that had nothing to do with the genre of superheroes. In fact, it's the only project I've done that's been outside completely of the genre of superheroes. And uh, it reflected more of illustration history. Uh, and I think it actually is kind of a better product. And it's also the one that's out of print. To young artists out there that want to be doing what you're doing, what would your advice for them be? Well, be more open-minded than me, than me obviously. Uh, you can't turn your nose up against working with a computer the way I've gotten away with. Basically, I've been getting away with murder and I'm in a privileged position. Everybody else has to learn to adapt to where, where the work is and what that work will demand you to work with to get paid. Um, but you can still enjoy uh, working on paper, working with paint. Uh, if you get to a stage where you can control more the kind of work that you make yourself, generally everything is going to get photographed or scanned into a digital file that from that point it becomes the plaything of whoever you're handing it off to. And that's all they need is that file. So how you got it to that stage that exists in that file doesn't really matter. So if you were able to make it through hand done artwork, you know, instead of spending all your time on a computer trying to make something look like it was done on paper or with paint on paper, you know, you can, um, you can do that for real, except again, when you're working in a commercial sense where you need to make alterations, I get it. You, you're going to probably want to stay completely on a computer. But um, again, if you get to the stage where you can be less, uh, redirected in the work you turn in where you're less edited then you know you could probably do what I've done which is embrace the uh, the real as I like to think of it. You did that amazing Flash Gordon piece which we came to see you when you actually were in the sketch stage of it and I you had said at the time that was one of the things that was on your bucket list to do this kind of definitive Flash piece is there any piece or character that you haven't done that is on your next bucket list? You know, a weird one that I've sketched out before and I haven't produced as a painting because I haven't got the direct license approval for it is I figured I'd do a piece of Queen. And as you got into involvement with trying to uh, get around licensing approval with Brian May directly, no such approval has come through. And if I ever do make the painting. It'll just be me doing it for the sake of posterity. So the sketch is what it is. And I figure that they slowed down licensing for a while because of the upcoming movie that we didn't know was likely to happen the way that it did happen. Um, and I'm grateful that did happen. But um, maybe I'll never officially make any artwork of Freddie and the, the band. But uh, at least I'm within my rights to create whatever kind of thing satisfies me. And I recently got a chance to do a Bowie piece with the estate's approval. So if only Brian May had enough input into his own band to actually give me direct approval, but somehow we can't get past that. Marvel's 25th anniversary edition just came out in March. Your Rise of Ultraman cover was just announced out in September. Is there anything else that people can expect from you? Oh, well, there was a press release also that's come in the last week, I think, regarding me being the new cover artist and designer of the newest armor for Iron Man. So that's a series I'll be on, hopefully overlapping with the time. I've, I've not been fired yet off of the Captain America book, but I'd like to think that I could keep both gigs going simultaneously. I've been working on them for months simultaneously, but uh, I regularly do covers for Hulk Captain America and Iron Man. And it's only now that people are learning about this new run and uh, the design I did. Do you tend to just work on one project at one time and, and 
blanket out anything else or can you multitask? Well, I plan things in groups of what I've got to get done for the month. So whatever number of covers I've, I've got to do, I will sketch out all those concepts within 24 hours or so and submit them all to the editor, uh, get reactions, and then quickly go into my photo research to match my drawings. So I'll be likely taking poses and modeling the various things which you've seen around my house. I've got all different matter of toys and life-size figures, heads, things that I can use as a reference. And of course, a deep reserve of photos I can look at for different people. Um, so I'll assemble all that stuff together and then one by one go through each cover. But each cover is taking me on average about two days to execute. So each thing is closely buttressed to the next thing that's of a similar, well, they, they may all be different subjects, but a lot of them fall into cer certain groupings. I was expecting you to say each cover would take about three months given the detail and quality of them all. So I'm, you know, I bow down to your talent, Alex. I really do. You're incredible. Um, so thank you so much for, for humoring me and being part of this web show. It's been absolutely fabulous to talk to you again. Uh, and I'm so excited that you were part of Life After Flash. And of course, 40th anniversary of Flash Gordon this year. It's all coming back out. Uh, so thank you so much. And I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. A fabulous conversation with Alex Ross. Now, when we finished the interview, we had a little chat, casual chat, where he started talking about a couple of things that I had stopped recording my camera, but recorded his still. So I just wanted to finish this interview by saying, if anyone's seen Life After Flash, Life After Flash, hope you have. If you haven't, you know where to go and see it. You'll see a scene where Peter Duncan discovers that he is not in the Flash Gordon poster. So here's a little clip from Life After Flash, and then here is what Alex had to say about it. Beautiful. Man. Oh, I did it the wrong way. Take it off. Yeah, I'll set it up. Pull that down nice. Yeah. Now, where am I? Where, am I? where are you, Peter? <laughs> if you'd be anywhere, you'd be in here with this group, yeah, right? You should have been in here, right? <laughs> There's space. I think space around here would be good. You, I, I didn't talk to you about this, I don't think, but like, I, I had to learn by watching the documentary that. Sam showing it to the other actor in the film, the one guy who I didn't illustrate. And it's the humiliation of, oh, oh, where are you? Like, oh, you're not in here. And that poor guy actually has lines in the film and I didn't bother to draw him because I couldn't foresee that possibly ever happening. That's so, do you know what? I didn't even think to ask you about that, but I remember at the time thinking, I wonder if Alex will see this and realize that he didn't put Peter Duncan in it. Oh, <laughs> I felt terrible because it would have been so easy to get him in there. It would have been, I mean, heck, I'd be willing to, you know, paint him over and we'd reprint the whole thing just to get this poor guy in the, in the shot. But, you know, I don't see that anybody's going to care for that effort. Yeah, he was fine about it. He was fine. <laughs> also, after I finished recording Alex's, I stopped recording Alex's camera, we were still chatting and he mentioned one thing that I wanted to talk about just briefly, nice little fun fact. Keep recording next time. I know, I'm always gonna keep recording. He was talking about using Sam's face as inspiration for artwork. He also used the face of Davy Jones, who is not from Pirates of the Caribbean, the lead singer of The Monkees. So as It's quite an unusual one. I wouldn't have thought like a hybrid of Sam J. Jones and- And, and Davy Jones, Jones, the Jones twins. So I just wanted to mention that, little fun fact, because I'm a massive Monkees fan. Turns out so is Alex, so super cool. Very good. Well, we should jump over to our partner in crime, Bob, for a look at what fantastic prop he's got in the bee cave. I love movie, movie art so much, besides posters, uh, original art pieces, and a few replicas. No art gallery would be complete without a few Alex Ross pieces. I actually worked with Alex Ross on this piece to create it for my DVD commentary. And speaking of DVDs, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this one before, but this is an original painting that Alex sent me for Christmas one year. I think a good trivia question would be, where have you ever seen this painting before? 
Hey, Ash, Lisa. I'm really excited this week because we figured out a way to feature one of the things in my collection that I truly love and I'm a super huge fan of. So Alex Ross did this painting a couple years ago for the Metal Edition DVD release of all the Universal Famous Monsters. And of course, my personal favorite Universal Monster happens to be Creature from the Black Lagoon. So with that, we thought it would be cool to link Alex's artwork up to a couple of artwork pieces that I have here from the creature and also maybe show you my full-size creature. Uh, I think in order to do this properly, though, we need to go all the way back to uh, when pictures were in black and white. So with the movie's oldest creature from the Black Lagoon, nothing has really survived prop-wise from the film. Allegedly, there's been a couple screen used masks or feet or something that have flown around the internet and it's really hard to authenticate something so old. So my creature replica is a super limited edition. A couple years ago, huge creature fan, uh, just like me, sculpted this amazing full-size Creeks from the Black Lagoon and offered several up to different collectors. And at the time they were being sold as complete fully painted creatures and were obviously like really expensive. Finally, through a series of events, which is not very interesting, I was able to get a hold of a raw casting of the creature from the actual artist. And that started a six month journey on assembling and fixing the creature and patching holes and all that stuff that goes into actually building one of these things. It was the first life-size prop that I actually was attempting to build. You know, the biggest challenge with doing a creature replica is nobody is sure exactly what color he was. The film was done in black and white. And most of the vintage photographs are also in black and white. So you can only get kind of the tones of him. There's a Life Magazine article at the time and they published several color pictures of the creature, if I remember this correctly. And those pictures are all done with super old 50s, 60s film stock. So the colors even there were definitely open to interpretation. In making my creature, one of the things I did to make sure he looked you know just right was i would paint a section of him and then i would take a photograph of it and turn that photograph black and white so then i could tell if the at least the values were correct so on my creature i did something obviously i think is cool i removed the sculpted eyes from the casting and i actually put in taxidermy fish eyes that you can buy for you know like big fish trophies that people hang on their wall or whatever he sits here in this little alcove and the way I set it up, which I think is pretty cool, we've got uh, a spare bathroom that we've named, uh, you know, the creature from the black bathroom. And essentially you can go into the bathroom and you close the door. And when you're done, you come out, the door opens right to the creature. And uh, it's such a treat because so many people get uh, startled by having the big green guy staring at them when they come out of the bathroom. You know, along with Alex's amazing piece of art from the Creature from the Black Lagoon, there's just so many artists that have done a version of the creature. He's just so iconic. And so I've been chasing artwork around for the creature forever. And I mean, you can just bury yourself in it. So I've really tried to like select just the classic pieces that I love. Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, that does it for this episode of The Bee Cave. Uh, we're working on some really cool stuff for future episodes. If you have a thing that you wanna talk about, drop us a line and uh, we'll see if we can get you on the show. If you wanna share some of your cool stuff. Uh, take care guys. <laughs>
So our competition last week was to win a Blu-ray copy of this, which is the fantastically titled Cleaning Up, Cleaning up the Town, up the, town uh, the Ghostbusters documentary, which is amazing. If you didn't see last week's episode where we interviewed the filmmakers, here's a card, go and check it out. It's interesting to talk to other filmmakers that have been on this journey just to see the similar stories they've had in bringing these films to life. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. But we asked you in order to win a copy. Signed. Signed. If you were going to write a ghost-related title of a film, what would it be? And we had some good ones. Really good ones. What was the now, winner? The winner was by Andy Buckland, and even other people were commenting that this should win Polterheist. It's pretty good, Polterheist. Bank robbers that get killed midway and I think continue the heist as ghosts. Pretty impressive. Pretty Very impressive. Good. So Andy, email info at lifeafterfilms.com and this will be coming your way. Next week, we will have another competition. Very exciting. And if you like horror and sci-fi, you might want to tune in next week. Don't forget to subscribe. Comment below what you like about the show, what you don't. Hopefully not too much that you don't like. What do you want out of the show? This is for us, everyone as a group. We want to make it what people want. Yeah. So I can't wait for next week's show. It's going to be Marvel Us. Oof, sorry. Oh! <laughs>